Part 1. You will hear the director of a childcare centre talking to the parent of a new child. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning. My name is Bob Ferguson and I'm the director of Ascot Childcare Centre. Oh, good morning. I'm Sally Ann Cullen. I made an appointment to enrol my daughter. That's right. I've got the application form right here. Now, first I need some personal details. So the family name is Cullen, is that right? That's right. Now, what about your daughter? What does she like to be called? Oh, her name is Alexandra, but we all just call her Alex. A-L-E-X. Great. As you know, we organise the children into different age groups. There's the babies group, the toddlers, aged two to three, and the preschoolers, they're aged four to five. How old is your daughter? Well, she'd go into the toddler group. She's just turned three. And we always like to make a note of our children's birthdays so we can celebrate it all together if they're at the centre on that day. When was she born? Oh, um, the 8th of November. Fine. And we also find it's a great help to know about siblings. Sometimes a problem at the centre can be related to problems with a sibling. Does she have any brothers or sisters? Yes, a brother, Fraser. He's two years older. So that would make him five, is that right? Yes, that's right. Fine. Now, we also need a contact address. Where do you live? It's 108 Park Road. That's P-A-R-K, Maidstone. Good. Now, last of all, we need a telephone number we can call if there are any problems. Oh, well, I'll be at work and so will my husband, so the best number to call is 3467 8890. Right. And is that a close relative? Yes, it's my mother-in-law's number. We prefer to make a note of how the person is related to the child, so I'll write down grandmother. Yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 7 to 10. That does make more sense. Now, that's all of the personal details. We also like to try and get a picture of your child's personal development. Can you tell me if there are any specific problems she's having? For example, does she get on well with other children? Is sleeping a problem? Oh, she gets on well with others, I think. But she does have trouble sleeping. We gave up her daytime nap a long time ago. That's good to know. I'll make a note of that. She can just have some quiet time while the others are resting, if she likes. <laughs> that should be fine. She enjoys drawing quietly. Right. Now, what about other skills? We occasionally take the children swimming, fully supervised, of course, and we only go in a paddling pool as we don't expect them to swim by themselves yet. Does your daughter need a lot of help getting changed? <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, she's been able to get dressed in the mornings for over a year now, so no problems there. That must be a big help for you. Now, what about the childcare arrangements? Are there any specific days you require? Well, I work Monday to Wednesday, but my mother-in-law has agreed to look after her on Wednesdays. So does that mean that you'll just need Monday and Tuesday for now? That's right. And what about the pick-up time? We offer extended hours for parents who work a great distance away. Hmm. I work until three o'clock, but it takes me about half an hour to drive home, so ideally I'd like to pick her up at four if that's OK. That will be fine. Now, is there any other information you'd like? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recording of a radio news magazine discussing the importance of doing good in the community. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, I'm Emma Robertson, and I'd like to welcome our listeners to Beyond the Lens, the programme that aims to dig deeper on issues in culture and society. Today, we have Professor Hudson McMahon from the University of Bristol's Department of Social Policy. Hello, Professor McMahon. Do you want to tell us a little about what you'll be presenting today? Of course, Emma. But first, I'd like to thank you for having me on the show. My wife and I are both avid listeners of Beyond the Lens, and it's a bit of a thrill to be on the show. But I digress. Today, I want to talk about the importance of doing good in the community and in society. There are many ways of doing this, but the two most common ways are volunteering and giving to charity. However, these methods of improving community and society have an important difference. While volunteering one's time is almost always a positive for society, giving to charity is significantly more problematic. Problematic, Professor McMahon. It would seem to me that giving to charity is always a positive for society. We celebrate those among us who are the greatest donors to charity. Yes, and in general, it is warranted. I do want to clarify. In general, giving to charity is good, but one must be very careful for two reasons. First, some charities do not do sufficient amounts of charitable good per pound. And second, some charities receive too much money that could be spent better on other causes. Let me discuss each of these in turn. This seems to me a rather radical thesis. It seems that way, but I hope to convince you otherwise by the end of the program. Now, getting back to charities, some charities simply do not give a lot of their received monies to the actual performance of good acts. For instance, some charities utilize less than 10% of their donations on actual charitable activities. The rest goes to salaries, promotion, and other overhead costs. So for a donation of £100, it may be the case that less than £10 actually goes to helping someone. That sounds terrible, but it still helps people, right? Well, yes. But as charitable givers, we should try and reward those charities who do most good with the least amount of money. By that, I mean that those thinking of donating to charity should do research on a charity before giving to the cause. There are other charities where more than 50% of donations go to the end cause. These charities are much more deserving of your patronage. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Another reason to be discerning when it comes to your choice of charities is what I call the relative utility of a charitable donation. Hmm. Let me take a guess here, Professor McMahon. Is the relative utility of a donation how much good it does relative to other donations? That's just about it, Emma. The relative utility of a donation is how much good a donation does per amount spent. For instance, the disease MND, motor neuron disease, was in the news in recent years, and M&D charities received a windfall of donations. This sounds all well and good, but there is a problem. Unlike, say, heart disease, M&D does not affect very many people. While it would be wonderful to cure the disease, there are better allocations of our limited charity funds. Wait, so you're saying it was bad for people to give to M&D charities? Not quite, only that it was suboptimal. Because there is limited supply of money given to charity each year, 
it is important that it is used at least somewhat optimally. And allocating overwhelming amounts of money to a disease that affects very low percentage of people is extremely suboptimal. That's very interesting, Professor McMahon. So how can our listeners try and optimize their charitable gifts? First of all, don't be caught up in viral social media campaigns. Instead, use such moments to remind yourself of the importance of giving to charity in general, and not just to niche causes with good promotion. And second, do your research. Before you donate, look up how much of a charity's donation go to the actual end goal. Additionally, Look up how many people are affected by the charity's end cause. The more people there are affected, and the worse they are affected, the more likely you should be to donate to that cause. It is all about maximizing good in the world. That certainly sounds like a noble goal, but if everyone donates... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two science lecturers discussing space exploration. First, you have some time to look at questions. Hello, John. How was your conference on space travel? Hi, Susan. It was great. We heard some fascinating speakers, especially one fellow who was an expert on Mars. Mm. He thinks it's quite feasible for humans to live there in the near future. Well, if we spent the billions of dollars that go into space research on looking after our own planet, then perhaps we wouldn't need to worry about the Earth being uninhabitable in a hundred years' time. Nor would we need to look for another planet to colonise. Yes, but there are some important things that space exploration can teach us, you know, especially about the history of our own planet and its atmosphere. That sort of knowledge could help us solve some of the problems that threaten our planet. Still, I don't really see why they have to send astronauts into space. Robotics is so much more advanced now. Why can't they simply send robots? Well, robotics has come a long way, and it is more expensive to send a manned spaceship into orbit. But the biggest problem with robots is that they have to be programmed for every possible eventuality. Yes, I suppose you're right. Robots just can't react to situations independently the way that humans do. They still need us to tell them what to do. That's right. Robots may have come a long way, but if you're going to go to all the expense of building one, you really need to make sure it's going to work when it gets there, and they don't tend to take risks with new and untested technology. What if it lets you down? So instead, a lot of the space technology nowadays is actually based on the technology they used in the 1970s, because we know that it works and it's reliable. So do you think it will ever be possible to send robots to Mars? I'm not sure. One of the speakers spoke about that, and he says that communication would be a problem. Is that because of the conditions? I mean, those extremes of temperature, and even the atmosphere itself, would probably create an awful lot of interference. Yes, but they're both issues that can be dealt with. Now, the real problem is simply how far away it is. That would cause long delays before the robots received any messages about what to do next. So, for the moment, they don't think it's feasible. Hmm. That makes sense. Now listen and answer questions. Tw
Tell me, do you really think we should be contemplating sending humans to Mars at all? Don't you think we should wait until we do have the technology? Well, many years ago, the civilizations that built the pyramids or that began building enormous cathedrals must have started the project, never expecting to see it finished. I think we should take the same approach and start our preparations now. That's an interesting point, though I'm still not convinced. Surely you don't foresee a time when humans will be living on Mars. That's just science fiction, isn't it? Not at all. I think there is a distinct possibility that humans will live there. But what about the conditions there? Even the dirt on the ground could kill us. Yes, I agree with you there. But we can easily build a self-contained structure there, so people don't need to go outside. Hmm. I suppose the ground does also contain a lot of resources, so getting metals wouldn't be a problem. That's right. A lot of building materials could be found there, but there are still many risks involved. Yes. What about radiation? I don't think there will ever be a way to shield us totally from cosmic radiation, even inside a spaceship. I can't agree with you there. Astronauts have been travelling in space for a long time now, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem for us. I just don't think we have enough experience of living in space long term. But you have to accept that it is within the realms of possibility that one day there will be a Martian space station. Well, I have every faith in science, and Mars does seem to be the next frontier. So yes, I imagine we will eventually send a space mission there. But I can't see people living there. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome once again to Introduction to Dentistry, and in today's lecture we'll be looking at the history of dentistry through the ages. Now, skulls of the Cro-Magnon people who inhabited the Earth twenty-five thousand years ago show evidence of tooth decay, and the earliest recorded mention of oral disease was in five thousand BC. This proves that oral disease is by no means a modern-day problem, and has in fact plagued humans since time began. That particular reference appeared in a text written by the ancient people of Sumeria, which referred to tooth worms. There is also evidence that dental problems caused difficulties in other early civilizations, and people from those times actually developed treatments for them. For example, we have found historical evidence that the Chinese used acupuncture to treat the pain associated with tooth decay. There is even further evidence of the troubles caused by toothache in the Ebers Papyrus, which is a text written between 1700 and 1500 BC by the people of ancient Egypt. This papyrus contains references to diseases of the teeth, as well as prescriptions for medications they used at that time. While today we automatically prescribe antibiotics, the ancient Egyptians relied on more traditional remedies to help with tooth decay. Firstly, olive oil. Which even today is known to have therapeutic qualities, and secondly, onions, which again are an age-old traditional medicine, and are still recognised as a reliable source of natural antibiotics. A large proportion of early dentistry was practised as a part of general medicine. However, by the fifth century BC, Herodotus, a Greek historian, made the following observation. In Egypt, medicine is practiced on a plan of separation. Each physician treats a single disorder and no more. Some undertake to cure diseases of the eye, 
others the head and others again of the teeth. The Greeks were at the forefront of dentistry of that time, and it was a Greek physician who lived between 1300 and 1200 BC who chose to extract problem teeth long before anyone else. Arabs were also pioneers in the area of oral hygiene and used a small polishing stick as a toothbrush as early as 100 BC. So, what of Europe? Well, throughout the Middle Ages, dentistry was made available to the wealthier classes thanks to physicians who would visit individuals in their home, while dentistry for the poorer people took place in the marketplace. Italian sources from the 1400s mentioned the use of gold leaf as dental filling material, but it was a Frenchman, Pierre Fouchard, who is credited with being the father of modern dentistry to his book The Surgeon Dentist, a treatise on teeth, which describes basic oral anatomy, signs and symptoms of tooth decay. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.